Welcome to the fourth and final lecture in the series, Search for a New New World. My name is Leb Bertoshenko. I'm Curator Public at CCA. The exhibition, Building a New New World, Americanism in Russian Architecture, examines how from the 19th century until the fall of the Soviet Union, the defining moments in Soviet history have been shaped by a series of idealized representations of the politics, technology, urbanism, architecture, and visual culture of America. Curator Jean-Louis Cohen explained that the Americanism in the title of the exhibition should be understood as a phantasmagoria, that Russian political thinkers, writers, and architects experienced ideal images of the new world as a sequence of fantasies, and that this continuum of visual and textual representations generated a kind of collective illusion that shaped Russian modernization. The exhibition rewrites the history of Russian architecture and urban design using this enduring Americanism. It takes an expanded definition of architecture and culture that encompasses industrial and graphic design, music, photography, film, and literature. So for the series of lectures, we move from the phantasmagoria of the new world to fantasies of other worlds and of our own world transformed by fantastic progress. The Russian Revolution itself was compared to a science fictional jump over the present directly to a radical future. It was supposed to happen in industrialized France or Germany, even England, but instead it occurred in a rural empire on the edge of Europe, almost untouched by modernity. This gap was responsible for many productive paradoxes, as well as the intensive search for models of modernity to learn from and surpass, like America. And sci-fi played a key role as a shared space of reflection on what was and wasn't possible in Russian reality and how to imagine ways of thinking beyond it. Its stories can be read as sites of contested attitudes towards science and technology and their roles in the production of a new world. Science fiction encourages new sets of rules, ideas, and worlds to emerge and play out. It is a natural container to fill with projections that reflect the current social and political circumstances. In Soviet Russia, the creation of science fiction involved scientists, philosophers, activists, journalists, and others beyond the literary community. A combination of critical capacity and mass engagement of educated professionals that was finally seen as dangerous. This was one of the reasons that artistic speculation beyond the so-called realistic near future was eventually banned. As we look at Russian sci-fi for competing ideas of modernity coming from a culture and particularly a political context that's strikingly different from our own, let's keep in mind that 20th century Western sci-fi offers just as many revelations, nightmares, and magical leaps over intractable social, political, and ecological problems. In the 1980s, as the West took a neoliberal turn, cyberpunk emerged to describe what would happen when the attack on the state was complete. Its stories describe worlds ruled by mega corporations orbited by hollow and powerless states. More recently, consider the desperate excitement around private spaceflight in a time of ecological crisis, and then reflect on what it means that humanity went from the scientific and political feat of launching Sputnik to launching a Tesla into orbit as a commercial stunt, or colonizing Mars, which morally limited architects have even compared to the discovery and colonization of the new world, or stories of proletarian rebellion in video games like The Outer Worlds. As you watch, I invite you to keep in mind how these fantasies offer lenses on contemporary issues, including those that are central to architecture and urbanism. The four lectures in this series follow the chronology of the exhibition from before the revolution to the end of the USSR. The first talk by Matthias Schwartz explored how pre-revolutionary science fiction kept returning to St. Petersburg as a decadent and doomed city, an open wound facing Europe where all kinds of cultural contagion could enter the national body and a potentially apocalyptic risk. In the second lecture by Asif Siddiqui, positioned post-revolutionary Russian culture in a turn upwards to the stars, exploring the 19-teens and 20s moment when space exploration and settlement was briefly described as imminent and achievable and popular enthusiasm boomed. In the third lecture, Natalia Maisova explored science fiction film in the age of Sputnik and the first manned missions. The 50s and 60s were a slow motion move away from socialist realist ideas, and this was also a rare moment of synchronicity where the sci-fi future appeared to be playing out in the weekly news. And now we have Fred Sharman. He joins us from Baltimore, where he teaches architecture and urban design at Morgan State University's School of Architecture and Planning. He's co-founder and principal of the Working Group on Adaptive Systems, and his work as a designer and researcher focuses on how architects imagine new spaces for speculative future worlds. His latest book is Space Settlements. If you have questions during the talk, please leave them as comments below the video or email us at public at so we can ask them to Fred during the Instagram Live Q&A. Thanks.
The idea that humans can and should go and live in space is about 150 years old in its current form. Over much of the course of that history, the impulse to live in space is often framed in terms of expansion. We need to go to space, proponents say, because we need more space. Space to live in, space to find resources in, space to discard waste in. We humans need space to get away from the past, and it's often implied, if not said outright, space to get away from one another in order to realize more of our potential. And to broadly simplify, if not oversimplify, the first wave of Russian cosmos thinkers, which is what I'd call the philosopher Nikolai Fedorov and the physicist Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, wanted to go to space in order to have more of everything that already was, more room for an expanding population, more of the resurrected past, more time and more resources for more people. Any technological change in this scenario would enable more of all of that, and any social change would follow along afterwards. And again, to continue to simplify for a second wave of cosmos thinking, which I'd center around the medical doctor and Bolshevik political thinker Alexander Bogdanov, the opportunity to live in space represented a chance to extend the revolutionary spirit of early 20th century Russia indefinitely, not with more of the same necessarily, but more of the unending new. And since then, it's been almost assumed as given in a lot of the writing about space exploration in the now former Soviet Union and in the West, that by going outward, we would find the novel, the transformative, the transcendent. So, but the premise of this talk is that there is another parallel or complementary way of thinking about living in space. In this, as Lev so well frames it in his introduction, expanded field of architecture, that is, in space science, design culture, and science fiction, it's possible to detect a turn as the 1960s rolled over into the 1970s. Space exploration and space settlement, in some modes from this period, was no longer about just going out, but also about going inwards. After the Apollo 11 moon landing, space ships, for moving, going, and exploring, gave way to space stations, for staying, for experimenting, and for the first time, for long-term living. And now these were the most technically advanced achievements in the newly changed space race. The designers of these spaces, and now places, refined and developed their work on the performance and comfort of the interiors, as the problems of a high-performing exterior envelope had already been largely dealt with. At the same time, after the end of the Apollo program in the United States, there was a literal return to Earth and other planets, as objects of study found newly strange, now that they are more directly perceivable from the outside. So what I want to talk about are these trajectories, these paths outward and then back inward, which I'll shorthand as extensivity and intensivity. And in particular, these returns in the 60s and 70s reveal something stranger than just more of the same. This is not simply a counter-revolutionary retrenchment to familiarity or conservatism. This is a kind of sameness made newly different. And that's what I'll hopefully be able to draw out here. And by way of beginning, I wanted to take an extended moment to discuss these two images side by side. These are both works by people who trained as architects and who were later commissioned to design living spaces in space by their country's respective space agencies. The rendering on the left is by Rick Guidis who worked with the NASA Ames Research Center in California in the 1970s on a series of so-called summer studies. These were opportunities for speculative, we might say blue sky, thinking about the future of humans exploring and living in space. In 1975, Guidus had worked on a summer study about the feasibility of building large cities and landscapes in orbit that could eventually become home to millions of people. And this is the topic of my first book, Space Settlements. In 1978, Guidus worked on another summer study to design industrial capacity for mining on the moon, which would have been the original material source for the space cities concept. And this project on the moon included the rendering, and to no small extent, the design of some interiors for the lunar habitat, including this view of the private living space in a typical staff quarters. So in the plan schematic here, this is just a little rectangle. Guidus would have been given the unit size, in the engineering plan of an underground room like this, and he would have had a lot of free reign to lay out and design the interior fittings. So in the text of the report that Guidus made that rendering for, the only reference to this space calls it one of, quote, 12 private rooms. And here's an overall schematic of the moon base to give you an idea of the level of detail that these spaces were gone into in the engineering specifications. 
those rooms, Guidus's room, would be just one small part of that tiny rectangle in the habitat labeled number eight. The other rendering is by Galina Balashova. Balashova was the only architect at the Soviet Space Agency, OKB-1, or Experimental Design Bureau 1, run by chief designer Sergei Korolev in 1964. She was responsible for the design of buildings and master planning for the OKB-1 campus. Inside the buildings that she laid out, Korolev's team of engineers was responsible for the design of the new Soyuz spacecraft. This craft included, for the first time, a new kind of space inside it. Previous crewed ships, like the Vostok that carried Yuri Gagarin in his groundbreaking 1961 flight, or the Voskhod that would carry Alexei Leonov to his historic first spacewalk in 1965, about which we'll say more later, these had basically only one room. So the cosmonauts would be strapped into seats within that room, and from their seats, they could reach all the necessary controls on dashboards and panels, and they remained there pretty much during the entire flight. Unless, like Leonov, they had the opportunity to take a walk in space, there was nowhere else to go. The Soyuz, though, had two habitable modules, so here labeled Descent Vehicle and orbitable, Orbital Module. One had the seats and a larger one beyond it where the cosmonauts could work, rest, dine, and sleep on the longer missions that the Soyuz afforded. This extra space, the Orbital Module, would be jettisoned and burned up in the atmosphere as the cosmonauts rode back home to Earth strapped into their seats in the descent module. Korolev was unhappy with the way his engineers were laying out the interior of this new living space in the orbital module. It was a challenge for them. Someone suggested bringing in Balashova, the agency's only architect, to design it instead. And here I'm drawing heavily on information that was unavailable for decades. Balashova's work was a state secret, even within the Soviet Union, until 1991. And her story was unpublished in English until Philip Moiser's 2015 book, Galina Balashova, architect of the Soviet space program. So what's relevant here is that in both these cases, engineering alone was not enough, especially for a living space. The two architects have made both spaces recognizably comfy and even domestic, while resisting nostalgic or backwards-facing tropes. Both of these interiors are in dialogue with visual and design culture in architecture and speculative thinking. Balashova's Soyuz owes much to the streamlined, early modern design work that had stripped away ornament in favor of clean surfaces and gestures. And here I'm thinking of interiors like uh, Norman Bel Geddes' Kitchen for Frigidaire, exhibited in the 1939 World's Fair in New York. And indeed, one of Balashova's first architectural jobs was to redraw plans of historicist government buildings so that they still looked appealing once all the decoration was eliminated. And this was part of a campaign by Khrushchev against so-called superfluous elements in art and architecture. Guidus' interior, on the other hand, is very much a work from the late 1970s that's about the early 2000s. It could be a textbook illustration of Charles Jenks' prediction from his 1971 book Architecture 2000 that the defining characteristics of design at the start of this next century would be described as, and these are the top level categories that Jenks lists here at the far right end of his timeline, semiological, biomorphic, space colonial, and service state anonymous. And I think Guidus' interior has aspects of all these, even with a little bit of Star Trek thrown into the mix as well. And this is a show that Guidus remains a fan of in its various incarnations even today. So each of these, the, the point is that they're drawing on conceptions of the future from their own recent past. But besides aesthetics, both are using methods that are specifically architectural. Balashova's great breakthrough wasn't about form or style, but it was about function instead. She organized all the sort of service stuff, the controls, the consoles, the equipment, the pipes and conduits, into a cabinet on the left, which she called a servant, and she designed other storage space into a couch, or as she has it, a divan, where the cosmonauts could at least have a sense of sitting and resting in zero G. And this is an old trick in architecture. It's probably best articulated by architect Louis Kahn during the same era in language similar to Balashova's as served and servant space. So here uh, in Kahn's 1961 Eschrick House, for example, you can see that the open spaces that the inhabitants would use every day are very clearly defined and that the service stuff, the circulation, the stairs, the kitchen and bathroom, are all organized in a way that helps shape that primary space. So for Khan, pure functional expression wasn't enough. 
Certain things had to be tucked away in order to maximize the clarity and utility of the major spaces. And this is exactly the act of design insight that got Balashova the official job from Korolev to design spacecraft interiors. And even though he could never have seen her work, it is the same technique that Guidus uses to organize his moon base interior. Workspace, interactive equipment, and storage for work items is on the left. Space for rest and personal items is on the right. Even a sitting area divan that doubles as a bed. So there's clear space between these functional elements. And there's one more parallel that's worth noting. Guidus' design includes a prominent abstract landscape mural by the divan. Since the moon base would be buried, there would be no possibility for windows to the lunar surface. It would be too expensive and risky to add them in. But even though the Soyuz orbital module does have and afford porthole windows, there are also artistic earthly landscapes included in Balashova's interior as well. She added, in every one of at least the first generation of Soyuz launches, a small watercolor landscape that she would make and hand deliver to the Soyuz assembly plant. Even in this initial proposal rendering, we can see the paintings next to the divan. These pictures no longer exist, she writes in Moiser's book, since they were incinerated with those parts of the spacecraft that burn up during landing. However, she says, each individual watercolor remains engraved in my memory and hopefully in those of the cosmonauts. And this is what one of them might have been like. So again, there's this double turn inward. Within a hostile exterior, the production of domestic interior environments becomes all the more important. But there's also this return from outside the Earth back to representations of it, as if within space, this ultimate outside, our planet itself becomes something like just another interior. And here I draw from the work of anthropologist Alexei Yurchak, who writes about Soviet culture from this era. In his 2013 book, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More, The Last Soviet Generation, Yurchak has a lot of things to say about daily life in the Soviet Union during the late 1960s through the 1980s. But here I particularly rely on his concept of vnye, which he defines in this way. To be vnye, he says, and this is a quote, is usually translated as outside. However, the meaning of this term, at least in many cases, is closer to a condition of being simultaneously inside and out of some context, such as being within a context while remaining oblivious of it, imagining yourself elsewhere, or being inside your own mind. So Yurchuk's use of being vignette is useful for understanding this impulse to create a new context, a new inside, for living in this vast outside. And also, I think, for describing this rethinking of, of Earth as kind of another inside that's invocable through these representations or windows to a now distant exterior. So in these space interiors by Balashova, being vignette is, of course, a, a, it's kind of a coping strategy. Space is a place that was first approached tentatively. No one knew until initial expeditions had been carried out from the Soviet Union and the United States if organisms from Earth could even survive out there. So after it turned out that survival was possible, then exploration was the new mode. What could be discovered? What new modes of experimentation and production might be possible when humans were sent, strapped to their seats, into this new and strange environment? But at some point, this new unfamiliarity in space became tied to the nature of living itself. These interiors are not about going, but about staying. Beyond the raw excitement and novelty of launch and orbital, orbital flight, with its existential risks, beyond survival, these images ask, how should humans seek to live? Balashova has taken all of that apparatus of survival and literally stashed it inside a desk and under a couch. Besides bare life, what is necessary in a space, this work asks, for simply getting through a day or a week? The new challenges were no longer outside the capsule, but inside it. So the displacing effects of living in unfamiliar environments are tame, and the unsettling nature of unexpected discoveries and events is brought back to a kind of ground. And this is the known end of the dialectic uh, in speculative space science, but also here in science fiction, we find more than adequate figures of the unknown end of that conversation. And I wanna talk about the Strugatsky brothers, these two towering influential figures in Russian science fiction, um, really in world science fiction, but in order to do that, I, I first have to talk a little bit about British science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke and his relationship with them, at least the speculative relationship. Clarke as a fiction writer was particularly good at collapsing fears and hopes about unknown futures in space into concrete experiences, spaces, and things. And I think Clarke's work uh, is best summed up by John Clute and Peter Nichols' Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. For them, Clark is the person, and this is a quote, 
uh, from his entry in the encyclopedia, who of all SF writers is the most closely identified with knowledgeable, technological, hard science fiction, but he's also strongly attracted to the metaphysical and even to the mystical. So and I think this contradiction, the encyclopedia says as well, is somewhat resolved by Clark's own third law that, and this is quoting from Clark, quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So Clark's most famous works, I think, often center around human encounters in space with what the encyclopedia calls big dumb objects. And these are seemingly simple geometric primitives, like the rectangular monolith from 2001, A Space Odyssey, and the giant cylinder from Rendezvous with Rama, both built by ancient, now seemingly vanished alien civilizations, with big mysterious implications for future human life. One of the virtues of Clute and Nichols' Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, I think, is that it, it doesn't just catalog the authors and their works, but it, cate it categorizes the themes and even the affects and emotions and sensations that are particular to those works and the different kinds of, of works that they are. And so the ones that they associate most with Clark and his big dumb objects are the entries for conceptual breakthrough and sense of wonder. And I think Clark returns these wondrous and en enigmatic artifacts and affects back to earth in a later part of his career as the host of Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. This television show that aired in North America starting in 1980 helped establish a kind of canon of unexplained phenomena including UFO sightings, sea monsters, Bigfoot, and other cryptozoological creatures, geographical anomalies like the Bermuda Triangle, and artifacts like the famous crystal skull and the giant stone spheres of Costa Rica. And these are big dumb objects that hint at prehistoric technologies and techniques that may have arisen in the deep past and then vanished, and maybe even that something like ancient aliens, like the ones who built Rama and the monolith, had taught humans how to do things that we no longer remember how to do. And of course, today we can identify some of these interpretations and impulses with racialist and even racist assumptions about the capabilities of indigenous and colonized cultures. But in Clark's work, uh, there is this same trajectory from the extensivity of expansion out into the cosmos, signified by the starship Rama and the Stargate that the monolith turns out to be, to the intensivity of a return to Earth made newly strange and mysterious with always more things to be found the more one looks and investigates. And the concept of vignette is useful here as well, as a way to talk about things that are both inside and outside the current context. In Clark's show and in the accompanying book, he articulates in his characteristic fashion three kinds of mysteries. First, those of the first kind that were once unexplainable inside the context of human science, but are now understood, so things like comets and other celestial phenomena that we understand to be part of a solar system generally. For Clark, those of the second kind are still misunderstood, but that might be describable without the need to drastically leave or alter the set of known contexts that we're already working within. And Clark further uh, distinguishes a mystery of the third kind, for which any explanation would be entirely outside the set of all contexts that we might currently be able to apply to the problem. And I'm really fascinated by this technique. This is kind of a development of methods to understand, categorize mysteries, technology, and magic. And I think this is honed in the way Clark thinks about deep space and the far future, so extensivity. And then he applies it back to Earth here and now, intensivity. And this for me is a bit like Balashova tucking away all the technology of the Soyuz into the desk and under the couch, and then making a painting of the Earth that's destined to burn up in the atmosphere. So the evidence of mystery is stashed away or destroyed, but nevertheless, some kind of unknowable mobile truth is out there. And this is exactly the technique that the Strugatsky brothers employ in the development of their own work. And um, I think there's, there's no real reason to think that the Strugatsky brothers and Arthur Clarke um, had read one another's writing. Clarke does not seem to have read Russian, uh, and none of his own stories were available in that language before about 1965. And this is after a period where the Strugatskys were already well into the same kind of territory that he was exploring. Uh, none of this work was widely translated from either end um, until the late 70s and early 1980s, and this is when kind of all involved had moved on to other concerns. But, and this is uh, uh, important for me, when they were published in the Soviet Union, all of these writers found a home in the magazine, and I'm going to botch the pronunciation, Technike Molodje, or Technology for the Youth. And um, so... If anything, what I want to show here is not something like a lineage, but maybe more like a resonance between the methods and themes of these thinkers and writers that sometimes do 
overlap and, and coincident venues and places. The most significant early work from the Strugatskys is arguably their future history, the so-called Noon Universe, centered around the collection of interlinked short stories in their book, Noon 22nd Century, first published in 1961, and then added to in 62 and again in 67, translated into English in 1978. This book tells a story about human development and expansion into the galaxy over the course of almost 200 years. The conflict here is set up in the words of the Strugatskys themselves, between the good and the better. This is socialist utopian speculative extensivity. They tell a set of stories that include a cast of recurring characters about a future in which humans develop faster than light travel and the cap capacity to explore other solar systems. And they go about this in these stories with this ethic of non-interference and scientific curiosity. And this prefigures, I think, Star Trek's prime directive by several years. But unlike the kind of situations on Star Trek, the explorers in this book haven't yet conclusively encountered other living intelligent species, at least within the scope of, of this book's engagement with the universe. They just find um, ecosystems unlike our own. So not intelligence, but definitely other kinds of plants and animals. They also find, though, relics from vanished ancient aliens who had obviously at one time used technology vastly more compl complicated and mysterious that even future humans could understand. And then they left these artifacts behind millions of years ago. But the Strugatskys use familiar domestic scenarios to mitigate and deal with all of this strangeness. Many of the stories here are told through the eyes of two space travelers who leave Earth in the early days of this future history, and after a catastrophic accident, return a century later. As they deal with the new realities of cooking, cleaning, traveling, working, and courtship in these future worlds, these modes of daily life are introduced to the reader as well. So there's this is dialectic between displacing novelty and familiar needs, uh, between, say, extensivity and intensivity, is even legible in the book's title, which suggests this kind of endless normalcy of midday, despite the persistence of human life into deep time and deep space. And I think you can also read this, this feeling, this vibe, uh, here in the book's subsection titles. So I'll read, read a few of them. Almost the same, Homecoming, The Planet with All the Conveniences, and then the final section that hints at deep, deep future history, what you will be like. So in the story of that name, and in a few earlier allusions, there's speculation about a human future in which people simply live in the cosmos like a person in their home. Quote, homo, homo omnipotens will inhabit the universe, one character tells her partner, the way you and I do this room. This home, though, and these rooms are made strange in the Strugatsky's later work. Their novella, Roadside Picnic, published in 1972, translated to English in 77, is set in a small imaginary Canadian town on the edge of a mysterious zone that has recently appeared there and in several other places on Earth. There are artifacts and forces in these zones that are extremely dangerous and overwhelmingly powerful. Free energy, anti-gravity, and other technological wonders extracted from the zone in the story get slowly integrated into the daily life of the town. But there's also death and disease there, and this not only affects those who visit it, but the danger seems to extend into the homes of their family members and even follows the town's residents when they leave. The people who visit the zone, as official scientists or as the illegal guides and scavengers known as stalkers, bring back inheritable disorders that affect their children. And some of the recently dead in a nearby cemetery get reanimated and behave as they did in life on a kind of autopilot. And these reanimations are less like malevolent zombies out for brains and more like sufferers of dementia or brain injuries who can't integrate new experience but want to return to their homes and the homes of their children to endlessly recount the past. So even though this is a profound rupture in the order of the world, the appearance of these zones, it's intimately mixed and bound up with quotidian things and the spaces of the home. And in the book, the character of Valentine is a scientist who studies the zone. And he's not as concerned about these reanimations. For him, there are weirder things going on in the zone or surrounding the zone. So this is a quote from uh, Valentine in the book. What? He says, oh no, that's merely puzzling. How can I put it? At least that's imaginable. I mean, when suddenly for no reason at all, things start happening, non-physical, non-biological things, end quote. And what he's referring to is this phenomenon where people who had lived in the town when the zone was created, a period the scientists called the visitation. They seem to change the way the laws of physics and chance work if they go and move away and settle elsewhere. 
and these immigrants, as they call them, bring with them a greater risk that their new cities will suffer from natural disasters like hurricanes and earthquakes, and they tend to make the people they come into contact with more susceptible to otherwise random causes of death. This is another quote from Valentin. He tells another character, quote, we're all cavemen in one sense of another, in one sense or another. He says, we can't imagine anything scarier than a ghost, but the violation of the law of causality is much more terrifying than a whole stampede of ghosts. So something in the way the zone works seems to prefer that those around it stay home and it bends the laws of physics to make that happen. So here, the scientist Valentin is performing a very Clarkian kind of operation. He's categorizing the mystery of the zombies as something that might be explainable inside the context of known scientific paradigms. So this is Clark's mysteries of the second kind. But the problem of the emigrants and the distortion of statistical chance in their new homes is a problem of the third kind. It is outside any previously existing context, and it, affects, it effectively makes all those contexts obsolete. And in a later era, uh, in, in his 1996 novel, Accession, science fiction writer Ian M. Banks called these kinds of situations outside context problems. Nothing about them could have been anticipated because no previous framing or experience would have made that anticipation possible. Yerchak's condition of being vignette seems to be a response to the existence of these kinds of problems. One avoids the dangers of events that shatter contextual frameworks by staying aloof and indifferent to those frameworks in the first place. This disengagement that characterizes the approach of the spacefarers to other potentially intelligent cultures in both the Strugatsky's Noon Universe and in the Star Trek Federation's Prime Directive is a kind of being vignette. The appearance of a starship in a planet's sky would be an ultimate outside context problem, but the zone is a different kind of encounter. Valentin has a theory that gives the story its name, that the zone is just a set of leftover artifacts after a much more casual event, a roadside picnic. He makes the analogy to a picnic in the field at the edge of a wood, how the animals around this site must have looked and listened as the humans in their motor car arrived and departed, how they must have marveled at the strange things left behind, just trash and forgotten scraps for the picnickers. What's world shattering to one type of existence is just everyday life inside another context. And Yerchuk, uh, in his book, references Roadside Picnic. Um, he kind of sees the zone as, uh, and this is a quote from him, a metaphor of late Soviet reality. The zone did not imply any concrete or real territory, Yerchuk says. It referred to a certain imaginary space that was simultaneously internal and external to late socialist reality. And he links uh, this kind of space to ideas about the West as imagined from within the Soviet Union. In the book Roadside Picnic, and in the film adaptation directed by Andrei Tarkovsky, and also written by the Strugatsky brothers, so I'm showing a few stills from here, uh, released in 1979, there's an ultimate location in the zone where a visitor is granted their innermost wish. In the book version, this is a classic Arthur Clarkian big dumb object. It's a giant golden sphere. But in the film, it's a space, the room. It's an interior within an interior, a room within a zone. And I'm struck, you know, as I'm showing these screen grabs of interior space within Stalker by the difference between the kind of cozy, homey, it's still speculative familiarity in Balashova's paintings for the uh, Soyuz interiors and the kind of really displacing um, uh, non-hospitable character of these spaces within the zone. And this shift from sphere to room, from space to zone, rhymes with Clark's own planetary turn and that of the Strugatskys. In the Noon universe, as in Rama in 2001, the spacefarers encounter evidence of ancient aliens out there in the extensivity of the solar system and in the galaxy. But in Stalker and in Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, investigators find evidence of ancient aliens in here, on Earth, by intensively focusing on the qualities of spaces and artifacts. These phenomena are outside existing contexts, but inside existing spaces. And so now back to Balashova, her space capsule interiors, and her now lost paintings of Russian landscapes. Hers was the first artwork in space, and her colleague Alexei Linov was the first person to make art in space. His was also a view of the earth, but from the outside. Balashova has told interviewers that she never had any desire to be an astronaut herself. She preferred to remain in the world, even as she designed spacecraft interiors that would go outside of it. But Leonov's career, I think, on the other hand, was mostly about um, 
this direct extensivity. So for example, before making uh, this drawing of a sunrise from orbit, which was the first drawing made in space, he had just completed the first trip a human had ever made away from their space capsule. If the trip to the room is a voyage to an interior within an interior, then a spacewalk is a journey to an outside beyond an outside. But Leonov encountered an outside context problem during his famous first spacewalk in 1965. After a little more than 10 transcendent minutes, in which, as he put it, my feeling was that I was a grain of sand, Leonov attempted to return to the Voskhod capsule. He found that in the combination of vacuum and sunlight, his suit had overinflated to the point where he could no longer fit back inside. He struggled and eventually decided to vent some of the oxygen away in the hopes that the suit would shrink. And this led to further problems as his limbs started to go numb and his vision started to cloud with droplets of sweat. He made it back in and only reported the problem once he was back on the ground. Despite all of this, he painted the scene again and again for the rest of his life. The return trip back to Earth was also fraught. The service module and his Voskhod spacecraft failed to separate completely at first. This caused drag that pushed the descent module off course. It landed Leonov and his crewmate more than 200 miles from their intended landing site, deep into the forest where the cosmonauts now had to concern themselves with wolves, bears, freezing overnight temperatures, and other matters of simple survival before rescuers could arrive. After this event, a special cosmonaut survival pistol was developed, and I like to think once they started bringing it aboard the Soyuz, um, I like to imagine they're stowing it uh, under Balashova's couch. This historic first spacewalk, though, would not have been Leonov's most famous excursion outwards. If things had gone differently, if problems with the giant N1 rocket had been worked out, he might have been the first person to walk out of a spacecraft onto the surface of the moon while he was training for that eventually canceled mission he continued to make artwork. And here, this is a, an early drawing of the uh, Soviet lunar lander um, made by Galina Belashova. Leonov published a transcendent painting based on his sketch from space in Technology for the Youth, the same venue that published Clark and the Strugatskys. His work, done alone and more often uh, in partnership with his collaborator and friend, Andrei Sokolov, was published there and in several books over the next two decades. And I think this work, uh, this painting, uh, this body of work by Leonov and Sokolov is particularly characterized by the certain treatment of objects and hardware. They seem to glow from their own inner light, kind of like the Strugatsky's golden ball is said to. And they always paint it in this tone that really creates a, a deliberate contrast with their background so that their singular existence within this hostile yet somehow welcoming exterior stands out and pops. And I know a few better examples of work that illustrates this kind of Clarkian sense of wonder that's such a key affect of science fiction in general. And incidentally, to bring one thread from earlier background, Sokolov illustrated, uh, also for technology for the youth, the same kind of giant space habitats painted by Rick Guidis, the designer of the moon base. Leonov's most well-known mission in space was not to the moon. Instead of going to a new outside, Leonov visited another interior. In 1975, the United States and the Soviet Union executed the Apollo-Soyuz test project, shortly after the beginning of the space race. In, in 1963, Kennedy had proposed, in a speech to the UN, that the United States and the Soviet Union could work together on the first human trip to the moon. The Soviets declined to take Kennedy up on that offer, but this joint mission in 1975 was a kind of fulfillment of that promise. The docking of the American Apollo ship and the Soviet, and the Soviet Soyuz also represented a kind of end to that race. It would serve as a political and technical precedent for future joint missions to come, like the shuttle's many trips to the near space station, and especially the construction and use of the International Space Station. Engineers in the two countries' respective space agencies worked together to design a new universal docking mechanism, the Androgynous Peripheral Attached System that was the ancestor of all future docking systems in the Russian and American programs to come. And this was only, believe it or not, Leonov's second trip to space, and it would end up being his last. Because of various cancellations and technical problems within the Soviet space program, he waited 10 years between flights. After this mission, he was promoted to chief cosmonaut, and he spent the rest of his career as the head of cosmonaut training. Leonov was friends with Arthur Clarke, um, he actually teased Clark about the resemblance of one of 2001's key shot to a painting of his, which you can see here on the left. And when Arthur Clark wrote the sequel to 2001, which was published in Russian by 
Technica Molejes, Molejesi, Technology for the Youth. He named the Russian interplanetary spacecraft in the book after his friend Leonov. And Alexei Leonov and Galina Balashova also knew one another well. Balashova, like all the best designers, valued user feedback from the cosmonauts. She took suggestions and critique and integrated them into subsequent iterations of her spacecraft interiors. The comment that she was most proud of, she wrote in Philip Moiser's book about her work, was from Leonov, who said, quote, Although I very much like the Apollo, it is not as well structured and wonderfully thought out as our Soyuz. The Apollo ships, it turns out, were cramped and awkwardly laid out. They only really had one room, dominated by the open frame seat for the three astronaut crew. There are effectively no spaces like the Soyuz's comfortable orbital, mo orbital module for the astronauts to go to for simple living. Technical equipment ran through the living space in a way that was disorganized, a problem that Balashova had solved over a decade ago. During the two days that they spent docked, the crews mixed. There was always at least one of the two Russians on the American craft, and at least one American in the Soyuz. They had gone to space in order to share one another's homes. And this event was again painted over and over again by Leonov and Sokolov, the two spacecraft becoming one object in the glowing void. This is also drawn again and again by Balashova. She not only designed the interior of Soyuz 19, the Soviet mission counterpart, but she also designed the mission's official emblem. It was worn as a patch by both the astronauts and cosmonauts and reproduced on commemorative and promotional materials all around the world. Her work was not public, and although the technical details of Soyuz were shared with NASA during this mission, few official images of the Soyuz interiors had ever been released, and popular books about spacecraft from, the dissolution, from before the dissolution of the Soviet Union often got the Soyuz interior design wrong, and no one ever offered credit to Balashova for either these interior designs or for her work on the graphics so strongly associated with this and other missions. Other highlights of Galina Balashova's career included the design of the livery for the Buran, Soviet answer to the American space shuttle, which only flew once in space in 1988, entirely on autopilot. It turned out that was on my 11th birthday. She also designed the interior spaces for the Mir space station's main module. This design was updated and adapted as the base block for the Russian portion of the International Space Station. So even though she has said that she never had any desire to leave the planet, Balashova's design work is still in orbit today. So to end this set of stories about excursions and incursions in 1970s space science and science fiction, I want to talk a little bit about this photograph. So here's Leonov, inside the space designed by Balashova, proudly displaying a sketch he made of his counterpart, the American commander of Apollo Soyuz, Thomas Stafford. I think it's really significant that on the first trip to space, Leonov went outside and then drew the sun and the earth newly legible as spaces that one could be outside of. But on his second trip to space, Leonov went inside and then drew the people that he was now sharing this interior space with. It's also worthwhile to note the newly changed interior character of that space. Balashova had made efforts to organize technical apparatus in a way that prioritized human comfort and suppressed the expression of the technology necessary for survival. The photograph, though, shows that artifacts from this inhuman technical world have now returned. In order to comprehensively document the historic occasion of the space race's conclusion and the reconciliation of the two Cold War superpowers, television cameras were installed everywhere inside the orbital module's interior, often broadcasting live. The cords and cables and equipment necessary for all that have, in a sense, escaped from the places in the desk and the couch where Balashova had so carefully put them away, and they've taken over her space. So there are multiple layers of representation here. There's the representation that's taking place by way of all this technology in order to kind of use broadcast to open up this interior to the view of the larger world outside and below. There is the expression that this, techni this technical medium now almost accidentally makes as it covers the comfy interior of the spaceship again with all of its conduits and tubing, turning it into something strange and alienating. But there's also the expression of this drawing from Leonov and the expression on his face that tells you that he's so obviously proud here to have made this portrait of his fellow inhabitant of space and this space and then given it as a gift to his new friend. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. 
And for our viewers, if you have questions during the talk, uh, please leave them as comments below the video or email us at public at cca.qc.ca. I'll pose your questions to Fred on Instagram Live on June 25th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for watching.